everybody. Welcome to this week's To Be Continued Book Club. This week we're reading The Charm Children of Rookskill Castle by Janet Fox. Chapter 1, The Fifth Charm. It is 1863. The winter winds shriek and moan around the castle turrets as the nightmare finds him. Poor cat boy John. He runs from room to room until he finds a place to hide. And then he hears but two things. The clattering and the ragged of his own breath. Quit breathing so loud, you fool, or you'll never breathe again, he thinks. His heart pounds in his ears, and his chest aches as he holds himself still and silent. The clattering, irregular, metal on stone, stops, and the dread silence that follows almost stops his heart, too. Now where is the blasted thing, he thinks. The only sound Catboy John hears beyond the pounding of his heart is the soft jingle, as of light rain on a bucket or a bracelet on a moving wrist. Oh, heavens help me. Then, click, rasp, click, like a clock being wound, and there it is again, not ten feet from where he stands, pressed against the wall behind the tapestry, the cold stone seeping through his thin shirt and up through the soles of his bare feet, the smell of wool full in his nose, suffocating him, the horrifying thing only feet away now, and closing in on him, metal on stone metal on stone, and his heart a thump, thump. His eyes press tight as the tears leak out beneath his lashes, his breath held in his tight, drawn chest. As one tear descends his right cheek and cleaves a line down his chin, he thinks, heaven help me, except that heaven is far, far from this place of unearthly creatures. How he wishes he could have saved the others before him, the fishmonger's daughter, the hunchback boy, the singing girl, but he is only a boy, brave, but not brave enough, more a mouse than cat, and at the mercy of a monster too dreadful to behold. No, he is not the first to be taken, nor will he be the last. One of John's own cats betrays him, fresh from the night's kill. The poor kitten drops a mouse onto John's bare right toe before she speeds away to escape the monster. The last John hears is a string of accursed words in a voice that comes from the depths perhaps from the devil himself, by flesh and bone. Outside, beyond the thick walls, the frozen moat, the barren yards, the ringing stockade, the moon slips from behind a cloud as the screams whisk away into the forest. Even the sneaking stoat hunkers in terror as the boy cries with the ripping pain of losing his very soul. Chapter 2, London, Fall of 1940, The Blitz. The pieces that made up Catherine Bateson's world were scattered across the landscape and over the ocean, far and wide, blown about by the winds of war. Cat herself felt like one of the clocks in father's workshop, all wheels and plates and springs and pins strewn across a table, waiting. But she squared her shoulders and told herself to hold her wits together. That's what her father would want, and what her brother and sister needed, especially given the urgency in father's letter to mum, the letter sending the children away. Are you sure? Robbie is pressed against Kat's left arm. She tilts the photograph so he can see. Wow, it is, he says, sounding odd. A castle. More like a not-so-majestic ruin, but maybe the photo didn't do justice to the name. Rookskill Castle. I bet it's got battlements, Robbie went on, and ramparts. I bet there are dungeons and secret passageways and hidden rooms and ghosts. Ghosts? Amelie popped up from the floor like a bobbin, round eyes in her round face. All castles have ghosts, Rob said. They moan and carry clanking chains. He raised his arms straight forward and stiffened his body, that they rattle at night when they come for you. Robbie, Cat said, a low warning. I can't wait to learn sword fighting, he said. I'm practically a whiz already. I doubt we'll be fiddling with swords, Cat answered. They'll have us a regular lessons. Lessons? You're being stodgy. It's a castle. Who in a castle gives regular lessons during wartime? Read father's letter, Rob. Rookskill Castle Children's Academy. That's what he says. She unfolded the letter, which read, Aunt Margaret's cousin Gregor is the 11th Earl of Craig and a good man recently married. They need the income as Lord Craig has taken ill I met with Lady Craig at the castle not long ago, and she seems devoted to children, having none of her own. 
As I was thinking of sending the children here, I held her secure instructors of my acquaintance, and I have reason to be back in Scotland from time to time, a sound choice for the children under the circumstances. Cat paused as she finished the letter. So there you have it. Father secured instructors. We'll be learning. You're dull. Of course we'll be learning. But it won't be sums and history and Latin. We'll be learning how to parry and form up and shoot arrows. Practical things we can use against the Jerrys. Rob thrust his imaginary sword and made an imaginary block. I've heard that the Jerrys are planning a landing on the beaches in Scotland. We'd best be ready. Kath folded Father's letter around the photo, tucking both back into her pocket. Amelie's eyes slipped from Kath to Robbie and back. I like those, Amelie said. She still held her pencil clutched tight in her fist. Maybe there'll be a ghost like Mr. Pudge. Kat smiled. Ami, it's an old place that looks like a castle and we'll be in school. And it's Great Aunt Margaret's cousin. Father may visit either. I'm quite sure there won't really be any ghosts. Kat had plenty of real things to worry about. For one, Robbie might be right. The Germans could land on their shores at any time. Kat worried about father and his reasons for being in Scotland and about mum and Great Aunt Margaret still being here in London while the Germans continued their bombing. And at 12, Kat had started in a new school and was trying to sort out where she belonged and who her friends might be, but now she had to leave. Ghost ranked low on the list of Kat's worries. You must look after Rob and Ami, Father had said. I'm counting on you. It was what seemed ages ago in midsummer as he was readying to leave. His tools laid on the bench before he fitted them one by one into the sleeves in the felted fabric. The clock he was done fixing tick-tock on the table behind them. She wondered how he could do two such different things, the one, men clocks, and the other, so dangerous. He didn't even look of the sort for the other, and she said so straight out. He smiled, pushing his glasses on top of his head and resting his hand on his sh her shoulder. Don't judge a book by its cover, Kitty. There's often much going on inside. I do what I'm good at, and I do it for you and your mum and Rob and Ami, and everyone who loves this precious stone set in the silver sea. Your mom has many cares, so you must promise to do your bit. Kat had promised, yes, but she wished her father wasn't so noble. She wasn't sure if she could bear it if he should be caught. Now she was sure about only one thing, that castle in Scotland, which she wanted to send them to, would be cold. Warm clothing was essential, and she would be the head of three young Batesons. As Kat was packing, Great Aunt Margaret called her to the library. Your father is wise to send you to Gregor's, Aunt Margaret said. We'll be away from this dreadful noise and strife. She paused, although I must say Scotland is a bit dodgy. An umbrella is of no avail against the Scottish mist. She, like father, liked aphorisms. Mum had once said it was the way great Aunt Margaret kept her mind sharp, and father had responded that if Cat's great aunt's mind was any sharper, she'd impale her pillows. Yes, she used to be sharp, logical, and precise. But to Kat's dismay, Great Aunt Margaret had lately gone a little dotty, perhaps more now with the bombing and the stress of the war. Mum stood at the tall window, her hands clasped behind her, fingers weaving patterns in and out like she was kneading dough. Great Aunt Margaret rose from her throne-like chair. Now come over here, dear. Time and tide wait for no man. I have something for you to keep you safe. She took Kat's chin in the fingers of her right hand. Cat knew the gesture. It meant, this is our secret. How it could be with Mum there, Cat couldn't imagine. She glanced at Mum, who raised her eyebrows as if to say, be kind. So Cat played along, forcing down a smile. Yes, ma'am. Great Aunt Margaret dropped Cat's chin and took a step back, and her hands went to her waist, to her belt of soft leather, pinned to it, dangling from it as it had every day in all the years of Cat's memory, was her great aunt's chatelaine. The chatelaine had been a gift to Margaret from her mother upon Margaret's marriage, and Kat knew it to be a precious family heirloom. Wrought of silver and marked with a smith stamp, the chatelaine contained three useful items that hung from slender silver chains joined on a silver hoop. Yes, said her great aunt, this will keep you safe. She was removing the chatelaine from her belt. And this is a picture of a chatelaine to help you picture what Great Aunt Margaret was talking about. She gave it to Kat. Oh, Auntie, no, I couldn't. Kat raised both hands in protest and looked to her mother. What if it should be lost? Nonsense. 
Her great aunt's response was firm, even as her stiff fingers fumbled. I'm having a bit of trouble. Help me, dear. Come now, I insist. Kat stepped forward, hesitant. She unclasped the chatelaine and held it up. The three items, pin, scissors, thimble, swayed as they dangled from her fingers. Aunt Margaret leaned towards Kat, her lips close to Kat's ear, and dropped her voice to a whisper. It's quite magical, you know. I'm sorry, Kat said back. Did you say magical? Oh, goodness. Kat saw worry in her mother's face. Aunt Margaret straightened. Yes, my dear, I shall explain. But do remember this. Be careful with magic. She fixed her eyes on Kat's. Do you hear me, Catherine? Magic is tricky. There is always a price to pay for its use. To discover what happens to the Bateson children at Rookskill Castle, check out The Charmed Children of Rookskill Castle from the library. Bye guys, I'll see you next time.